hi everyone and thanks for joining us. Uh, this is the second in the series of industry webinars that we are doing, which I am very excited about. Uh, today, uh, you're definitely in the right place if you came to discuss working in the industry post lockdown. But before we get into it, I am just going to introduce myself. I am Kadi, I'm a music manager and the community creator at 30 Plus One. Uh, 30 Plus One is a community for independent music managers and artists that manage themselves. When I came to the industry from a long career doing something else, I found that some of the biggest challenges were um, connecting with the right people and um, having the finances to access the kind of services that you need. So with 30 Plus One, the aim was to use strength in numbers and collectivism to address that. Trade, got trade union background in case that, that slipped through. Um, and uh, the idea is that once you join the community, you get access to an instant network and access to opportunities and services that you might not otherwise have been able to access on your own, particularly at the developmental stages of your career as a music manager or independent artist. So just some quick housekeeping. Um, the format will be that we'll have a quick presentation, well, we'll have a presentation uh, about the subject, and then there will be some opportunity to ask questions and uh, have some answers and uh, join the discussion. Um, we will have a dedicated time for questions, but you can post questions throughout. If you use, uh, depending on what screen you're using, you should see uh, air, a button to press for Q&A and we can just stop them up and answer them or you can save them to the Q&A section and then we can go to you and you can ask them uh, through audio for yourself. Um, there will be a poll so get involved and there is also chat so you can interact with each other and share comments as we go along. I will be monitoring the chat and James who is a member of 30 plus one. Hold on, let me just unmute you James so you can say hi. I thought I did already. Um, uh, James, say hi. Hi, guys. Hi, Stu. He'll, nice to meet you. He'll be my, James and I will be monitoring the chat. And um, yeah, so we'll pick up anything there. And of course, this is a virtual meeting, but we want to try and make, give you the opportunity to. Um, engage with each other as well as what you'd get in the physical meeting. So at this point, I would definitely encourage you to say hi in the chat to everyone, to say whether you're a manager, or whether you're an artist, and to you can post a link to a project that you're working on, or you could say something about something that's coming up, and then you guys have the chance to interact individually with each other. So without further ado, let's get on to it. I can't wait. Um, so our speaker today is a specialized music career project development mentor and coach. I, I have so many questions about that, but we can come back to that and coach. Um, I wel we welcome Stu Lander. Thanks very much. Hello, everybody. So um, I'm going to try and flip in and out of a presentation. I don't want to have a presentation on all the time, um, but we'll do a bit of the old screen sharing here. Um, I was showing um, Katie what I do in my performing life at the moment, so I've got to go back to that one. Right, okay then. So we're going to be talking about working in the music industry after lockdown, really very specifically uh, for the community. I, I had a chat with Katie about the sort of people that are here. So it's really aimed at kind of grassroots uh, managers and self-managing artists very firmly. Um, Firstly, just a little bit about me. So, uh, yeah, those are the various things that I have been and am. I started as a performer a really long time ago. Um, I started writing for music trades like Music Week and Music Business International and Audience, the live music magazine from about 30 years ago. Shortly after that, I became a partner in an independent label called Zip Dog. did quite a bit of exporting um, around Europe and Australia and some other countries. Um, 
then I uh, became a lecturer at a top music degree, the commercial music degree at Westminster, around about 20 years ago, and got my own master's in music business management from then. Um, and nowadays, I am a lecturer on a master's course in creative entrepreneurship at LCCM, which is this um, interesting building here called the Music Box. I still perform in extreme drumming called Taiko, Japanese drumming, which you can see me here with my band, Sun Lotus Taiko. And I've had our whole festival season cancelled this year, so I'm feeling it with everybody else. Um, and uh, I still write articles. This is one I did about the Shires. I tend to write for kind of glossy mags now, and I've um, written about the bass player of Dire Straits, who's now a painter, and some uh, new acts like an act called Bash from Hampshire. Um, do that kind of thing. So, and I'm also, um, as Katie said, I am a specialised uh, career and project development coach for music uh, creatives of all kinds, um, people involved in the business side, whether they're employees or entrepreneurs, sole traders or whatever, and also the higher education sector of um, students from undergraduate to doctorate and um, lecturers and staff and all that kind of thing. So, I'm going to talk about really, this is very specifically about what I see are the impacts of the coronavirus and its fallout and of Brexit, which will follow on from that fairly soon and give us an, an interesting double whammy. Um, so let's look at first of all about what music tells us in hard times. And I'm going to just stop. Yeah, okay then. You got me. Um, so uh, actually, recession which was widely predicted is going to be bound to happen um, and probably happen twice with a certain amount of lack of confidence from Brexit, actually is not at all bad news for the arts and for music. Um, in the 1970s, there was a very deep recession um, and that actually is specifically linked in the literature to bringing about not only punk, but also new romantic. Um, both fashion side trends relied a lot on secondhand clothes and strange charity shop garb and stuff like that. I remember going to see The Clash um, and uh, yeah, everybody was in kind of hand-me-down dinner suits and that sort of thing. Um, and musically as well, um, they were uh, act talking very specifically about unemployment and hopelessness for the youth and that kind of thing. Um, as the clash there they are um, so it's a time when um, young people have little to gain from conforming and playing the game and little to lose by doing their own thing there's often high youth unemployment you may find that again um, and that tends to lead to hanging about at each other's house and doing music um, then after that, the next thing that we had that where the effects of recession were very clearly shown um, was in rave, which arguably is the most widespread um, universal music format that there's ever been. Um, that arose from Acid House in the ghettos of Chicago and Detroit in the mid 1980s and was really strongly nurtured in the depths of the very early 90s recession in Britain with free parties. Um, so uh, again, that was another situation where the things that people were making the music with were very cheap, Atari computers, old drum machines that hadn't worked for the, when they were in their main life and were repurposed, um, all that kind of thing. So in many ways, uh, creatively, uh, it's a good thing for music in the arts. Now, from the audience's point of view, it's also good because what happens is that people tend to be restrict their big spending. They don't change their car. They don't move house. They don't go on a posh holiday. Um, and therefore, they do want some distraction from the grim situation. And if that comes in 10, 20, 40 pound lumps, so much the better. So historically, it has always been a good time for the arts. And I'd argue that in music, it's actually a particularly good time now because the whole sector has pretty quite long ago and more and more shed the need for big money to uh, make records and to, to make the music in the first place, to make records of them and get your music out to the people and get yourself known is all much cheaper than it's ever been anyway. Plus which we've got things like crowdfunding 
and there's a lot more uh, arts funding pots around if you're doing the right kind of thing. So uh, really we're very well set up. Music typically is kind of nimble, agile. So that uh, tends to work really well. Um, so I'm gonna talk separately uh, about what is, is happening, the uh, current predictions and the likelihoods of the record sector, the live sector and copyright um, each in turn. Yeah, so um, yes, I wanted to make sure I said this too. So uh, if you wanna know more, um, about the music and the recession. As it happens, a former colleague of mine from MA Music Business Management, which I worked on till a couple of years ago, this is Sally Gross. Uh, she's doing an online talk called Leadership in Times of Crisis on May the 21st, focusing very strongly on that. So um, I hotly recommend that if you wanna see what kind of opportunities are presented by these tricky situations. Okay. Um, right then. So, looking at recording uh, and live and copyright. Now, um, the record industry um, has been good for streaming overall, which is kind of what you might expect. There was a bit of a dip because um, people were more at home and less mobile, but uh, the quarter one figures for Spotify show that there were more subscriptions, more active users, whether ad supported or subscribed, and more streamed. Um, and it's looking like that's going to go up. So the Apple and the others will probably um, follow in that kind of thing. Um, and we've been in this situation long enough to have some kind of habit formation. So if people weren't streaming before, then they maybe will be doing so now. If they've gone back to their CDs and vinyls and tapes while they're at home, they may then want to extend out and find more through streaming. Um, So yeah, for the record industry, there's not really any uh, great effect from um, coronavirus at all. Uh, physical sales have dropped off due to the high street, but the BPI boss uh, said in an interview uh, only a couple of days ago, actually, that he sees those people that buy CDs and vinyl as quite loyal to what they do. So when the availability for that comes back, that will probably come back in, in decent measure. There'll be a blip in the figures, um, but in terms of investing in the future, it's about the same as it always was. Um, got the pages out of order. Oh, here I am, good, good, okay. Um, yeah, so, okay, um, that's fine. As far as Brexit goes, I can't really see that there's going to be much of an effect on the record industry at all. Um, it wasn't tariffed anyway, it's intellectual property and that uh, it's only manufacturing um, and food and things, agriculture that are, have got a tariff protection. So it's going to be just the same as it ever was. Um, the only way I can see it making any difference is that there might have been record sales that are stimulated by tours that may not happen. Um, and there might be some physical, such as vinyl, rather than things being licensed out to the territories, but very marginal. So yeah, I don't really see, apart from general economic conditions, um, that uh, the record industry is going to be affected by Brexit. Um, the live music sector is a whole other thing, of course, and everything's shut and the festival season is progressively being canceled and you can't really see it um, coming back anytime soon. So very recently, there was a Nighttime Industries Association survey of 200 businesses um, about how they thought things would happen after lockdown. Um, they said that they thought they would be able to work at around about 40% capacity, and uh, two thirds of them said that that wasn't viable. So it's gonna be a, a long way back, and particularly for live, and that included restaurants and all sorts of other aspects of the nighttime economy. Um, but I think that uh, once enjoyable experience of shouldering your way through people to get to the front or get to the bar in a nice hot gig is also maybe going to run counter to habit into how people see their lives nowadays, whether we, well, you know, we're all missing our hugs, but <laughs> whether we'll want them back or not, when we have the chance, we'll have to see. And we do have to think about the social as well as the business aspects of things. Um, 
as we go forward. Uh, so it's going to be tough and a long way back. Um, and also, this is really only the latest setback, um, to be honest, for live. And I think we've got to reappraise what live does. Uh, we probably all know that the grassroots venues have been in through a crisis. There was a report that Boris did when he was the mayor of London about it um, due to property development and um, audiences going and doing different things. Um, but that was only news because the mid-range sector got punched out decades ago um, when the councils and universities stopped really supporting it. And it's made the progression ladder for promoters and artists difficult for a long time. The people, someone I coach is doing absolutely great business in the low hundreds. But the trouble is the next venues in her area were like a thousand. Um, and that was a whole different game. Um, very hard for her to make sure she could underwrite. So the mid sector has been gone. And then in the top, the industry has known for a quarter of a century that there's going to be a talent crisis at the top. Um, and now it's becoming very evident as the old big ticket acts retire um, and there just aren't enough um, acts of sufficient weight to fill the gaps. Just look at the age of the people who headline Glastonbury um, and who can manage to do arena tours. And most of the time, you know, they're knocking on 50 or more um, and there isn't really enough acts to follow them. There were some, of course. But so the whole live thing is going to need to rescale from where it has been historically. And we're gonna to have to think differently um, about what live music, how it's presented, what kind of value it's got, um, and fully reappraise it. Festivals, not so much actually. Yes, they're going to get hit um, and it's going to be a bit socially difficult to regain the environment, but at some point, they will be able to go back um, probably quicker than fixed venues because they're pop-up events. They can reconfigure themselves to some extent. They can change the scale of what they're doing and reprice and everything. So actually, I think the festival market is one of the places that uh, you um, performers and uh, managers should be thinking about very carefully and thinking about on scale, thinking about the cafe stages, um, and the various uh, smaller ways that you can get in the afternoon slots, anything that you can do to get in there. Um, so those are the kind of the effects of coronavirus, very severe, yes, um, and maybe semi-permanent. Um, as far as a Brexit goes with that, there's been some predictable moaning from the music industry. They always moan about everything. They always have to, I mean, started writing about it. But actually, I think, um, the effects will be fairly slight. I would argue that the bottom tier doesn't really rely very heavily on Europe anyway. It creates some opportunities. You get a few jollies at festivals in your first exciting European tour, but it's not an important thing. And you have to have quite a bit of profile in the UK most of the time to make that work. Um, and then there's the top tier where uh, offering a domestic act instead of an international act just isn't going to work. It's not a matter of price. It's a tick box opportunity. People will pay a lot if they can see um, a mythic act that they want to see, and there is no substitute for that experience. So that leaves the kind of mid tier. And uh, I think there, quite a lot of that actually is made up of acts who are really fading in the UK, but who have maintained audiences in more conservative countries in Europe. Um, and yeah, maybe they will suffer and that's maybe uh, just a bit of natural selection and will um, leave the field open for others. So I'm not too worried about that. And then there will be some people who are on the rise who are missing an opportunity and having trouble sticking together that income. There's going to be in that kind of people who are uh, relatively less than 10 years into their career and coming to expand into Europe, that there's kind of a problem. But as I'll show later, that also will present some opportunities as well. Um, looking at royalties, uh, mechanicals aren't affected, I don't think, uh, they're diminishing, but they're not affected. Um, performance royalties are gonna take an enormous hit. PRS boss, Andrea Martin said yesterday that she can't even guess the scale of how much royalties will fall from the closing of venues. Um, and she expects that to hit smaller acts um, hardest. That's in a report on the BBC website yesterday, maybe today actually. Um, a UK music has said that the contribution of the live music um, to the UK economy is going to drop from around about a billion to 200 million. 
So that's sobering, um, an 80% drop in that revenue for the sector. And so therefore affects the investment potential and um, business confidence and those kind of things as well. So um, let's next look into what that means for the talent sector. Uh, so I'm going to branch out from my quite factual thing now um, and start telling you what I think people ought to be doing. Um, so after difficult times uh, and in times of great change, people want quite a lot of stability at first from their culture. They want things they can rely on. And so I predict that what will be popular with the audiences during the next year or so, maybe a bit longer, will be relatively conventional music with upbeat messages like unity, value of family and friends, the beauty of nature, all the kind of things that have been coming through in the year uh, from lockdown, actually. Um, and I think to have those things back is going to be something that people will want to celebrate. Um, they, they won't want to be um, thinking about too much about their pain and suffering. Um, and scratching their head over the musical format. Generally, you have a return to romanticism and classicism um, in times of great change. You can see it in pop, actually. Every time there's something big going on, um, like the launch of electronic music or anything like that, there's equally some massive revival happening at the same time. Check the history out if you don't know that. It's a very interesting thing. So uh, I think also uplifting dance hybrid formats will be popular even without support from clubs. I think it's just there'll be uh, increasing wish to celebrate whatever it is that we can celebrate. Um, looking beyond that though, I think it really is way past time for some proper innovation, some real surprises. The market has for many years been saturated with people who've been to college and know how to sound like anybody they want to sound like. Um, they know the rules, they know the, the rules of the business side and all that. And there's really just not been anything that has gained serious traction that could any way be called new for many, many years. Um, and this may well be where recession comes in, plays a part. If there's nothing to gain by playing the game um, and everything to gain by being distinctive, then um, that indicates that that could be good timing for people to get together and do something new um, and I really hope it will um, and a rather more wild card thought I've got is that I think there's going to be extensive deregulation of drugs in many countries over the next few years the hard work's been done in the US and Canada um, the results are there there's cannabis companies trading on stock markets over there um, and I think that most countries will follow because the advice from many experts in the past has been that that's what should happen. We should get it out where we can see it, cut off the criminal community. Um, and uh, it's usually drugs that have a role in when music takes a big leap forward. Um, the 60s, the 70s and the 80s uh, all had that element in them. So that may well be uh, something that will produce some innovation. Um, um, yeah, so sometimes I think people might think it's a, a bit of a kind of old guy thing to say that there's no new music around. It's very difficult to keep back and, and know whether there is or not because there is so much different stuff going on. But because I'm a lecturer, I do keep in touch with people in their late teens through to their 30s, the graduates. Um, and I can tell you that they all think the same thing. Uh, they all listen to a lot of old music. And I think in a way that's a bit of a shame. Um, so uh, let's really hope for a bit of a revolution there. Not now. Uh, in a couple of years' time. Um, one thing that Brexit has told us, I think, is that actually it's hard for young people to influence things. Demographically, they're not strong at the moment, um, and they also lack some of the money and opportunity, and they're in a kind of settled environment that was formed by the baby boomers 50 years ago, who know the rules. Um, so uh, if old people are categorized as being over 50, and the youngest of those was 18 during the second summer of love in 1988 and the consequent massive boom in dance music. And someone who's 70 now with 18 is after the first summer of love. And I know people that age who saw Hendrix and the Doors and um, that kind of thing. Um, and when Florian Schneider of Kraftwerk died recently, I posted I'd been to see him in 1976 and I thought, oh no, that's 44 years ago. So my point here 
is that you might think about music for older people, but that might mean music that has adventure, surprise and energy in it um, and refers in new ways to the formative music that they had. Because um, now they, they've got money, they've got leisure or that kind of thing. And how, how, what new music could you make to wean people away from their club classics and the all time greats of rock? Going a bit out on a limb style-wise, I think that masculine consciousness in culture will be the more space. I'm not saying it will be men, just the masculine ethos of doing things, which I think is already clear in a lot of music made by women, like FKA Twig, Natalie, Halsey, uh, there is a number of others. Um, I think it's because it has been documented that culture became very feminized over about the last 20 years, if not more, and there's an inevitable cyclical change, which I think is already starting. And I also think that Brexit, when we are kind of in the flow of it and actually having to do it, is a masculine type of energy. It's about pursuing a principle regardless of danger. It's about asserting independence and uniqueness. Um, and so, yeah, uh, I'm kind of going a bit off on one there, um, but I do think that is something that will return in some way. When we think about the format of talent though, I think it seems at the moment that the permanent band is a bit over. Um, there've been almost none of them in the singles chart for several years, and they're also gonna to be too expensive for gigging in the incubator venues. Yesterday, I did an interview with a fairly, uh, well, not that, an act called Gravity Drive who were making their second album. Um, and they said exactly that, that they only actually put a proper live show together to promote a major release because they can't afford to do it otherwise. Uh, they have to pay people who are not with them full time. They've got quite a big production. And here there may be lessons for people from a couple of marginal areas for music in the UK, folk and rap. So rap's worked for many years with loose collectives and crews, uh, varying different talents who take part when they're needed and go and do other things when they're not. Um, and the folk scene where I live, I'm in Devon, um, the Southwest tends to rely on people guesting on each other's tracks and coming in for their live shows. So there's a small acoustic show format that's easily expanded for a big show by using mates. So that's something we may think about, about how we become more agile and cope with a shrinking live music market in terms of format. Because I think the baseline capacity for small venues, we used to take for granted 150, 200. I think now we will take for granted 75 to 100. So acts that can perform in small spaces and do pop-up gigs and maybe play on the street, will have more chances. And I don't mean just acoustic stuff, it's something with a stereo out and a couple of mics is another format I'm thinking of in that way. So these types of collaboration are uh, really ways of managing risk, um, which is the next thing that I want to talk to you about. As a mentor and coach for music people, I'd say one of the main ways that I help them is by helping them to analyze risk objectively. Um, it doesn't mean avoiding risk. If anything, it means taking a bit more risk by removing any irrational fear around it and having a proper grip on what risk actually is. Though it does also mean that if their exciting idea is kind of based a bit in rock and roll myth or um, secondhand information, it gets a good examination before they go ahead with it. So it increases people's confidence to take the right risks at the right time. Um, so here are some ways that I think risk can be managed in the situation that we're facing. Um, firstly, as I just mentioned, collaboration, um, whenever you get an opportunity. Um, collaboration between artists to cut costs and combine audiences. Collaboration across different arts to make innovative offerings and, and access different funding sources. Um, collaboration between businesses, uh, sharing your skills and resources and helping out when you're sure it's going to be of much benefit to you if it doesn't do you any harm. It's quite a useful word I came across um, several years ago. I come from Silicon Valley, which is co-opetition. The ability to cooperate with others in your sector, even if they're direct competitors just hoping that you can win out because you're sharp or you've got a better product and that the information enriches you all um, and helps your, your whole sector. And also that sharing your own knowledge, like when you teach, helps you to understand things more deeply yourself. Um, then there's diversification. Um, 
I don't actually believe that anyone is owed a full-time career in music. I think we should all assume that it will not be possible um, and treat it as a massive stroke of luck if it is, certainly in the next three, five years. So I think you should think about productive ways that you can diversify and use your talent in adjacent sectors to the commercial side of music. So here are some examples. Um, I'm coach to an act which is crowdfunding its second album. And the um, lead singer is a qualified music therapist. Um, and so what they are doing is working out different kinds of events on both sides of the fence, the band side and on her side, that create uh, cross fertilizations, um, revenue flow for her and for them, um, and uh, audience awareness uh, and on both sides as well. Um, and there is a lot of money in this game. Um, I did an article um, just over a year ago with a lovely guy called Craig Pruce. Here he is. Um, and he has made a series of devotional albums and he's also a film composer. Um, and uh, he has sold of the Sacred Chance is his series, the Sacred Chance of Shiva, the first one. He sold 10 million copies of that, mostly through non-traditional outlets. Um, and the series continues to sell. Um, it's meditational and devotional music as you've seen with a kind of Indian theme. Um, also, um, one of my former students, um, mate Nina, who is now in Germany, makes her living um, as a meditation practitioner, but she also has a strong practice in meditation and music um, that she sells. So there's um, something there um, as one of the strands of diversification that certain people might have. Um, I know someone also who uh, has a um, franchise of reggae choirs um, that she has in London, around London, and also in the Midlands, and is developing that model so that she can just act as a franchiser and other people run it. She runs it all herself at the moment. Um, but community choirs, that kind of thing, I do think that community um, and therapeutic things, um, all kinds of social contexts will become more and more important as commercial revenue fragments, um, as a main living or a side strand. Um, now there was an interesting radio show about music in the environment a short while ago. It's the show's called Costing the Earth on Radio 4. Um, and one of the solutions to the carbon load of touring that they proposed was that there's gonna be more equipment available to hire venue by venue, and less of it trucked from one place to another. So thus, having an equipment hire business could provide revenue and give you new contacts. Um, and similarly, I remember uh, some years ago now that Fergal Sharkey um, of UK Music then said that there was money waiting to be spent on rehearsal rooms and people wanting to set up rehearsal studios. Now, I think an after effect of coronavirus will be a move from metropolitan cities, to smaller cities and into towns. Um, the hit was so bad in cities um, people frankly not behave themselves too well there either. This may actually show up first in the student sector. Will people be so keen to go to London or Manchester when they could do their degree in Brighton or Falmouth? Uh, then young house buyers may also start making different choices that become evident over a year or two. Now these places outside the metropolis uh, areas are really short of all kinds of facilities for musicians and there's grant funding available to start for them. They make it easy to keep an eye on the flow of talent um, and on change of taste. And so that could be a smart move as part of a portfolio that you run. And then relating to Brexit, one business opportunity that I thought might arise is to actually specialize in organizing European tours. So people with language skills, um, people who are prepared to learn the new ways of border control could find themselves a profitable niche uh, if they can do something at the right cost to uh, stop people scratching their head over whatever the new situation is. Okay, so finally, I would like to um, talk to you a little about how I see the evolving role of the artist manager. Um, I think that the questions for self-managing artists and for aspiring managers are very different questions. Um, 
Um, I think artists should ask themselves whether it is actually wise to keep all their business to themselves because it takes the time away from specifically producing intellectual property, which is their revenue future for exploitation across all kinds of different things, synchronization and all sorts of things. Um, and also it's a distracting different mindset for scheduling, budgeting, meeting dull people of different kinds and all that kind of thing. Money's cheap at the moment and it will be for quite a long time. And I firmly believe artists will be best served by concentrating fully on their creativity and allowing someone who lives for the game of business to add that value for them. I actually had was a big difference of opinion with one of my fellow lecturers who said, oh, you should do everything, you should make your videos, you should control your business, you should learn all, all about it all. And I went, no, I don't think you should. And actually, you can track the end of serious creative shifts pretty much to the beginning of the millennium when it became possible for people to manage their entire careers. And I, I really don't think there's been uh, a lot of notable genre shifts um, and revolutionary change since then. And I think it's because people have to spread themselves too thin, doing social media, doing deals, doing all that kind of thing. Personal opinion. But I think this, because it's, it's money's cheap now, I think the thing is to invest in the thing you really believe in and love to do, which is the music. So um, probably should be looking to develop yourself to manageable level because there has to be a surplus. There has to be energy that the manager can exploit. Um, people look, artists look for manager much too soon. Sorry. Um, for managers, I think the key question is, how can I manage to make money when there are not going to be advances? There are not going to be big thumps of product sales or tour revenue surpluses. I think it's going to be very hard to justify charging 20% of gross, um, unless you can do that something the acts couldn't do for themselves if they feel like doing it. Um, and that's actually why I think coaching is going to be so important. Check on where I should be. Sorry. Now I'm going to stop sharing. You have me back now. Here we go. As I thought. Um, life of cultural production is very uncertain. There's no clear standards of performance. There's no logic to why things do well or don't. There's a constant need to try and surpass what you've done before. No way of being sure that you'll do it. There's a tricky relationship with a fickle audience and industry, a relationship which you must maintain in order not to become too introvert and lose the plot altogether. There are typically strong incidences of depression and substance abuse in that community. So I think the return of a sympathetic but a bit detached person, a sounding board, um, someone with an extra hand for the tiller, who has a strong role in nurturing the acts as well as exploiting just their business side, seems likely to be a successful model. A bit like Paul McGuinness with U2 in their early days. Um, and then the alternative to that is to split that role with an experienced coach and a dedicated business manager. But for artists who want to manage themselves, then I do think that having a coach or mentor, someone you can just chat things through, who will ask you important, dumb questions and things is a really important thing to have. Um, so I hope I haven't uh, run too much over time. And, um, I will just say thank you very much. And if you'd like to get hold of me, that's how you do that. Hello, that's to do coach. So I'll hand back to Katie now. Thanks, Stu. That was great. Um, so much to think about. Um, this is the time. Oh, sorry, I've realized I haven't. Let me just start my video again. Uh, this is the time for people to ask any questions that they have. Um, actually, we had a poll as well, didn't we, Stu? So mm -hmm. it'd be quite yes. interesting to see now, I'm going to launch it, what people think, considering that context that you've given them. So, will musicians need a manager in the future? Um, let us know what you think and um, I'll keep a monitor on that and we'll come back to it and get posting for your questions. So I had a couple, as I was thinking, or a couple of thoughts, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, so looking at, we, we, you mentioned it, and it makes loads of sense to look at history and sort of what's 
uh, what emerged in music and what stuck. And um, he talked about like the last time sort of we had those e economic kind of challenges and things that came out were a lot of independent music and sort of that grassroots activity, raves. Um, what like what else? What else was there? I, mean, I, I guess what I'm trying to get to is what are some of the things that happened then that maybe people can start to replicate now? And I don't know whether that will work because I don't know whether that's necessarily as innovative as it needs to be, but it might be, it might be some ideas to get people started. Well, I mean, those things uh, all happen pre-internet. Um, right. So, yeah, so there's one thing. <laughs> I mean, you know, so the this whole uh, virtual gathering thing, which is in its, in a way is a kind of an extension of the, the not going out movement, which began quite some years ago. I was lecturing about that five plus years ago, um, but how kids were not spending so much time going out. What will happen next if they've actually been shut in by force? <laughs> Maybe they'll want to go out more. <laughs> um, but but there's, there, there is this whole new context to work with um and and so much ease of communication i talked about things like cross arts collaboration which i think yeah. allows people to make a much richer offer i mean you could see that if you went to uh, some of the kind of early 90s uh, london clubs like meg triplets or something you you'd see that kind of thing happening anyway people were bringing in their mates in decor and fashion and that's become more cemented in but i think there's plenty of scope um and to be the, the visuals are much easier to do than they were then it wasn't digital. I did it, but it was taking ages to do anything. Um, so I think there's a tremendous amount of scope. Um, and uh, yes, if people are taking the right drugs, they will be able to exploit that scope. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we've had a question come in from Fred. Fred, I'm gonna put make you live. Hello, Fred. Let me bear with me one second. Uh, let me see. Oh, here we go. Hi. Hi, hello. Hi, Fred. Hi, good. Fred. Hi, what's up? <laughs> good. I'm good, thanks. You uh, just posted a question. Do you want to? Do you want to say it? Yes, I want to say. Um, uh, good evening, everyone. Hello, everyone. Hi, um, Fred. Yeah. Um, um, I I just wanted to know: Is it possible? during this lockdown to successfully um, host a live concert, you know, and get everyone glued on that concert? Is it possible at this time? Online, you mean? Yes, yeah. online. Yeah. Well, you, in your Q&A, you said to do a, a paid-for concert. And I think that's the, is, pers is very much possible to do online concerts and people are doing them. Um, but they're doing them essentially as promotion and placeholders. Um, and I kind of think that's mainly what they're going to be because uh, to do something as almost as a one-off where you're going to somehow paywall it um, and also provide value against the competition that's doing it free. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not really sure what the, what the saleable product is from that proposition. So broadly speaking, you're great if you can think of a way, then you get rich quick. Um, but in, in general, I think that the, the principal value of them is in expanding the audience for the recorded material and for the future physical live shows, really. Okay. Thank you. Hi, Fred. Okay. Um, so we have the results of the poll, if you can see them there as well, Stu. Um, so, will musicians need a manager in the future? The top answers seem to be often management isn't for everyone, and uh, managers should be able to increase revenue to justify their fees. Um, but that's, that's uh, yeah, <laughs> for all of us uh, managers out there. But I mean, I, 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 I think. I think you did. You you went that way as well. That actually, what artists should be doing is really focusing on the creative. And actually, if we're talking about innovation leading the way, then 
then that we did I, I'd anticipate that comes from the creative people the artists and then leave the business side to the manager yeah and it's very innovation is very time consuming um, yeah. much more so than following rules and just producing something quite similar to what came out before um so so yes I, I agree with that yeah that that is my my strong feeling but of course it's it's a it's counter to the current wisdom really and i think that's a good thing but generally it's kind of oh keep control of everything you can do it or you've got a laptop that's all you need you know what i mean and yeah, yeah. we have another question from my okay. yeah hello hi Mary. Hello, Katie. Hi. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, you mentioned um, uh, 60s and 70s music, um, uh, 60s summer of love stuff, punk stuff, uh, uh, new wave, late 70s. Mm. Uh, and I, I kind of do music that's influenced by, by that uh, stuff, or some of the music I do is. Uh, I just wondered how you feel about uh, reaching an audience with those kind of genres these days. Um, they're popular with the young. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I mean, they're, they're, they're classics and loads of young people are, are, are influenced by that. So, yeah. Yeah. So I suppose my answer kind of based on the kind of things I was saying is that at, at, the, at the moment, I think that people from uh, 18 to 30, in my experience, are um, almost overly reverential towards music of the past, and they certainly are. Um, mm. Whether they are then, their, their level of interest in being consumers of music of the present that is like that, I don't actually know, to try and think clearly about it. I know people who enjoy making it. I know some a band who all dressed like Led Zeppelin in 1971. They managed to find some crushed velvet somewhere. And, 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 they, and as makers, they are following that very strongly. Um, mm. I don't hear of people seeking out, well, this bit, but... Um, seeking out strongly music which is new, which is of the classical. So yeah, I don't think I actually know that for sure, but there's certainly a, a taste for it. So that I think, as usual, it's not about anything but the strength of the songs. Yeah. In the same way that vocal contests aren't really about vocals, the only people that last have got proper songs. Um, it's not about style or fashion or anything, it's entirely about substance. Um, yeah. I think if you can, lure them away from listening to classic rock then then they will come that's good to hear thank you okay uh thanks Mari. um we have another question from joe Hey, Jeff, how are you doing? Hey, hey. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, so you mentioned that uh, the commercial revenue would be fragmenting slightly. So, I wanted to know what you thought about like uh, publishing because they were saying it was very much the boom of streaming, and that uh, that, that you've, you're starting to see places where like catalogs are being sold to companies like Hypnosis, who are being put on the stock market. I wanted yeah. to know how you thought whether whether you think streaming is going to be viable, or, or whether you think that there's going to see a dip. Um, yeah, just just that really. Um, I don't see why there would be a dip. Um, it's just that the, it's when you look at the, the gathered market statistics, those will seem good, but I just think that they will be more and more fragmented um, by uh, amongst uh, different um, receivers. There'll be mm -hmm. more and more people getting smaller and smaller uh, slices of the pie, uh, really. It's a great time for to be in the audience, to be able to get your music cheap to free, and to be able mm. to explore without financial commitment, all that kind of thing. Um, again, what I don't, I don't, you know, it's very difficult to know. And even we've got this privilege with streaming of knowing far more than we've ever known about the audience. But even so, um, it's quite difficult to keep track of. And as, as I am on Spotify and as I watch my feed of what my friends are doing, I hardly ever see the same thing twice. You know, mm. I just see this endless stream of difference. And so that's what I think is that for each for each person trying to gain revenue, their experience will be that they're getting a tiny, tiny slice. OK, perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. OK. Um, 
Okay, we have uh, no more questions waiting, but I, you mentioned something, uh, you mentioned that there's a long way back from uh, live at the moment, uh, which I completely um, understand because the thought of being in a busy club right now yeah. um, <laughs> feels really far off and uh, not particularly inviting. Um, what, what, without live and you know if it is really really far off what specifically especially for the developing artists i know you said innovation but what kind of things are going to substitute that for a developing artist who might just be able to perform a few small local gigs well first of all then um some of the innovation may need to come from the venue side rather than the artist side. If they want to do it, how are they going to do it? And I don't think we we know yet or have, have seen um, how that could possibly work. But it's one of the reasons why I talked about very agile formats for things, about uh, being able to, I know you've got a duo, you know, manage, but being able to do things that, that can expand and contract in size the way that the Southwest folk bands and the rap queens do, um, that sort of thing. Um, anticipating that, you know, if you're gonna start your gigging life, you know, I started mine on a stage where you could fit multiple martial amps and a drum kit and all that kind of thing and the support bands gear on all at once. And now I think you're gonna go, it's gonna be that little triangle in the corner at the back of the cafe. That is, is a place where things will be happening. Um, as I said, I also think festivals have more scope to be back more quickly. They've got more space. They've got more configurability of their offer. Um, and um, the, the diversity of the festival environment is, is a, a really you know, important now. Um, you want to do, be able to go to a range of different cafes and tents and stages and contexts and outdoor new talent bits and all that kind of thing, with glades and whatever. So I think that's, there may be a hot competition for it, um, but I think um, that, that uh, getting, looking at being able to do and, and happy to do smaller slots at festivals for cheap um, is going to be one of the first things that you'll be able to do. Then I think all you can do is probably respond to what the venue market wants, but expect that it will want some cut down productions. Okay. Um, James, I think you had some questions. I do. Thanks for the talk, Stu. I really appreciated how you covered so much breadth within a relatively short time. Really appreciate that. Um, so I hope you don't mind answering this question, but as you were giving the talk, I was wondering as a coach um, rather than a manager, what have you found people coming to you for during this pandemic, if you don't mind answering that question? Um, I don't. They haven't. <laughs> no. Um, and, and, and that's OK. I be, it's really so, um, coaching comes in a number of different flavours and I am not a life coach. I am what's called a solution focused coach. Um, and so people come to me with a project that they want me to ride shotgun on, like a release or a tour plan or something like that and keep up with critical questions um, and that sort of thing. It's mostly a questioning kind of role. And if people aren't doing anything much, they haven't really got any questions that need answering. Um, so yeah, I'm expecting to be back pretty soon. I'm kind of awaiting the, the emergence of things um, when people think that it's viable to do so. And I'm, I'm also kind of restructuring, trying to think what else I could offer um, and adjust my own way of doing things towards new environments but a lot of it's pretty classic um, it's kind of the challenge actually is that because I have studied and worked in many areas of the industry over a lot of time you have to kind of set that aside and try and come with a beginner's mind all the time um, and ask yeah dumb questions but the right dumb questions not the ones your dad asked um, but yes yeah, so it's kind of uh, that that's the role but yeah I, i'm focused on sort of projects and career development so I, i've had a bit of a hiatus with that really and i've been yeah, and with other things journalism a lot of what i do there's nothing to write about either i'm kind of looking for leads for october and stuff now 
Fair enough. Thank you for that. Thank you. I guess that kind of segues a bit um, quite nicely into what you were saying about um, no one being owed a full-time career in music, which is quite heavy. <laughs> um, and I guess in terms of managers, doing uh, offering services in a different way or doing different things is, I guess, um, part of that diversifying what you can do and being flexible and nimble and that kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, I agree with that. Um, that's why I chose some things that I think are more um, attuned to the business consciousness, you know, like maybe running facilities higher of different kinds, um, but which also gives you a, a bit of a flow, keeps you in a, in a news loop, which I think you need as well. Um, not to try and, you know, not to go off and just do something really dull that doesn't tell you anything, but something that's um, still connected. Um, yeah, uh, looking into kind of um, taking the weight off people uh, doing managing their early European tours when we're after Brexit, I think is a, a specialist thing. But I think one of the things that I didn't quite get to that I want to say for managers in particular, I think for artists, self-development is a given. You, you know that you are you're going to work on your art uh, all the time. Um, whereas I think the whole the notion of continuing professional development and structured development and challenge taking and everything for people on the business side is a newer and less familiar idea. And it's just going to be extremely important. How are you going to be the best choice for someone who has a choice of a manager? You know, what special knowledge can you have to offer? What can you excel at? Um, you know, what free courses can you take? What skills have you already got that are untapped that could add into the offer that you already have? Uh, there's another thing that you, coaching and mentoring is very much about. It's kind of going, well, haven't you got that? And are you not doing anything with that? Spotting, opening people's minds. And yeah, I think for, for, for the managers, if, if I leave them with that thought, it's kind of gone, Look at, look at continuing professional development, structured, get better at everything you do, at time and work management, at appraiser, at interactivity with other people in its personal relationships, at electronic communication, at money, whatever. There's so many opportunities to, 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 yeah, to, to kind of grow, stimulate yourself, um, keep your mind flexible and, and be the best one out there. Yeah, I, I really love that line of thinking. One of the questions that um, I get fairly often is from, from new managers is about how to get clients and how to get people to trust you. And I feel like that kind of answers that as well. You know, if you get just get really good at something and specialise in something and and sort of market yourself in a, so then you can market yourself in a certain way, position yourself in a certain way, which might then differentiate you from other choices that people have. Um, yes. So that brings us to half past, just gone, which is Band on the Hour. I really loved that talk. Um, for me, Thank it's you. given me so much to think about. Actually, some ideas, other things that I might get into, <laughs> um, are more, even more side hustles. Um, and hmm. I hope people have um, managed to take a lot away from that as well. Um, we are going to draw it to a close now. James, I don't know if you had anything you wanted to say before we close up. Can I mention my special <laughs> offer? Oh, yes, of course. Let's, let's do that. Um, okay, people. Go okay. for it. Okay, so um, I am offering uh, uh, three coaching sessions for the price of one. Um, if you buy a coaching session from me for £60, you will get two, usually in monthly intervals, free after that. Um, and in the session, you get a 45-minute phone or video call, and you get a follow-up with notes and research I've done for you and links um, to try and progress your career or your project or whatever it is you would like me to do. You also get a 15-minute free phone call where we decide whether we could do uh, work well together um, with no commitment from you. Um, and uh, I love doing it and helping people. So I really hope that some of you will take this up. That sounds Goodbye like a brilliant more. offer. Thank you.
You can find um, me on, on my, my site or Facebook. I am Coach Stu. Perfect. I was just going to say you can share your contact and or if it's easier for anyone out there, you can um, contact me 30 plus one via Instagram and I'll pass your contacts on to you as well. Um, so thank you everyone for, for, for coming. Um, I'm just double checking. I'm just doing a quick scan of the comments. Oh good, people were um, getting involved, sharing what they're doing and where they're from, which is cool. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, if you want to carry on the uh, discussion, I will post some questions and some comments and things on the Instagram account so you can get involved there and uh, yep, like I said if you need to get Stu's contact details but you, it's pretty easy though your email wasn't it Stu? Yeah it's hello at stu.coach Yeah so um, or do that directly okay um, James do you want to say bye? Yep bye and thanks again Stu Okay everybody thank you yeah. bye everyone yeah. the next one the next one next week uh thursday and we are one particularly for producers looking at um producing success so yeah all the all the info is on instagram see you guys have a good evening bye, bye.